Jay Williams was a superstar at Duke. Now he wants to buy half the program. We'll hear from him, and we will get a look into the athlete-led podcast space in the wake of the Kelsey brothers signing with Amazon for a reported $100 million. Plus, we have a bunch of tenuous situations involving NFL contracts, and the Arch Manning era may be beginning. It's Monday, September 16th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, you'll hear from ESPN analyst Jay Williams on the life of a high-profile basketball analyst at a large company in transition. I have a conversation with Matt Schwimmer of Playmaker, which produces the podcast of Shaquille O'Neal, Angel Reese, and other stars about the state of that industry as contracts quickly escalate. We also get the latest on Disney and DirecTV after those two agreed on a new contract with our writer Eric Fisher. Plus, we check in on Tua Tagovailoa, Hassan Reddick, Deshaun Watson, and Jamar Chase. First, let's hit some headlines. UFC has set a record for gate revenue with $22 million for its Noche event in the Vegas Sphere that saw Sugar Sean O'Malley upset by Marab Devalishvili in the main card. Dana White said last week that UFC spent nearly $20 million to produce the epic effects around the fight. White praised those involved, calling the event seamless and perfect despite minimal rehearsal time. Jamar Chase has taken a $50 million insurance policy against himself to safeguard against any potential lost earnings from injury. This comes on the heels of news that Chase has done negotiating with the Cincinnati Bengals for a contract extension. According to Adam Schefter, Chase felt misled by the Bengals after they told him at the end of last season and during the offseason that he would get an extension, which did not happen. The NFL has cleared the 49ers in its investigation around running back Jordan Mason's comments last week. Mason got into hot water after revealing to reporters that he was given the starting nod for week one, two days before the team listed Christian McCaffrey as out. Mason told reporters, that's why I don't really like talking to the media because you say one thing wrong and then, you know, I don't know, just skip that question. With McCaffrey now on the four-week IR, Mason will continue to get opportunities to start with appropriate notice now. 18-year-old Connor Zalish survived double overtime restarts to win his NASCAR debut at Watkins Glen on Saturday. Zalish is just the seventh driver in NASCAR's history to win his debut and is the second youngest driver to have won a NASCAR race. Disney and DirecTV reached a deal just in time for week three of college football, ending the ESPN blackout that was affecting more than 10 million customers. The dispute got ugly after DirecTV filed an FCC complaint against Disney, alleging they did not negotiate in good faith. My colleague Eric Fisher covered this one from start to finish, and he joins us next to explain where things stand going forward. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. So Disney and DirecTV have a new deal, Monday Night Football and college football and all everything else that ESPN shows is back for around 11 million subscribers. Uh, But this deal is not like other deals. What's unique here? There are a number of things that are unique. Uh, The two things that really sort of jump out is that DirecTV got what they were looking for in terms of being off, being able to offer what is called skinny bundles and do uh, put in front of their consumers and their subscribers. genre specific packages that if you just want a sports related package or a uh, family related package or some other content genre, you have the ability to have something smaller than sort of the big bundle with a whole bunch of channels you may not be watching. That's number one. The number two thing and particularly relevant for our audience here is that the forthcoming ESPN flagship direct to consumer streaming service that has all the bells and whistles beyond ESPN Plus and all the content that flagship uh, uh, programming that ESPN offers, that's going to be offered to DirecTV consumers at no additional cost. And this was one of the big parts of the negotiation that DirecTV was making the case that its consumers shouldn't have to pay twice for the same content. And one of the key provisions, again, is that that will not happen in this case, that this uh, very highly anticipated service, those existing and forthcoming DirecTV subscri- subscribers will get that service uh, as part of their subscription. Just quickly on the skinny bundles thing, I guess there's a certain irony here in that it wasn't so long ago that the great advantage to the cable companies is they could get people to pay for all these channels and they weren't watching 80, 90% of them. Now, obviously with streaming, they have too much competition for this to be something that um, is an advantage for them, you know, obviously. But so that's that's something that, that they wanted and Disney was trying to, Disney wanted the status quo essentially here. 
Well, yes and no. They were able, they want, they were willing to offer uh, skinnier bundles, but they wanted to do so not at some big discount. And another thing that sort of came out in this deal was a direct language to what both sides are calling market-based terms that uh, we don't know exactly what that means in, in very specific dollars and cents, but essentially there was no discount as I'm sort of understanding it, that Disney was able to get the economics that they wanted. And that was always sort of the condition of this is like, we'll talk to you about skinny bundles, but we got to make sure that it's not at some huge discount or whatever, and it's not devaluing our content. And so they were able to work out something where this was done in a way that that content was not devalued. Yeah. And so I, I don't think we know the financials here, but it sounds like DirecTV got kind of the contractual stuff that they wanted. Disney, it sounds like they got the price that they wanted. More or less. Yeah. DirecTV subscribers are going to be able to get the ESPN flagship streaming service that we've been hearing about for I'm not even sure how long at this point. <laughs> um, this feels like maybe a win-win for both sides, at least at the outset, because um, yes, DirecTV gets to offer this big benefit to its customers. Disney gets to come in with some number of millions of ESPN subscribers uh, just to, to prop up that service and when it first starts out. At least some subset of that uh... 11 million plus subscriber base is going to be right off the bat an automatic subscriber of ESPN flagship. That's the current working name. It'll have some other name between now and the start of next football season. Uh, but that, to your point, that gives a huge initial base and it, took many, many months for ESPN Plus to get to that kind of level off the gate. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is a huge leg up. And you would expect to see similar deals put in place over time between Disney and the other major distributors because uh, – they're, you know, these deals sort of end up mirroring each other in a lot of respects. And so ESPN flagship is going to have a huge uh, base right out of the gate in terms of the potential audience is going to be able to reach. Yeah. And I have to think this is setting up not necessarily a conflict, but at least an interesting situation for whenever uh, this deal expires. And, you know, I think we don't know the, the number of years, but we can, you know, I think you were saying just before the call, you're Imagine something like three to five years. Um, These deals are often in that sort of length, yeah. At that point, ESPN flagship, whatever it's called, will have established itself, and we won't know the state of DirecTV at that point, but Disney will then, yeah, have its decision of, does it jettison DirecTV, or does it say this is actually kind of working for us? Um, maybe try to continue with the status quo. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about where where this might be all headed. Well, generally speaking, these deals are all, and much like we saw between Disney and Charter last year, um, and to your prior point of the sort of changing nature of the entire cable market, the days of passive income, whether in linear TV or in streaming are, are ending, and they're ending very quickly, of course. And so that requires deals be really transformed to reflect this kind of new market reality. We saw that last year with Charter, this new deal with DirecTV, again, sort of looks to kind of present itself in a much more modern and current way in terms of this changing landscape of the entire pay TV market. And when we get to the next expiration point, they're going to have to do that again. And, and certainly all we know at this point is that the pace of change is accelerating. And so wherever we end up at that point in time, I think it's a safe bet that that next deal is going to look pretty different than this one, just as this deal looks pretty different than the last one. Yeah, absolutely. Eric Fisher, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. 
Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa will see a neurologist after suffering another concussion during Thursday's loss to the Bills. That has put a lot of uncomfortable questions about him and his career back into the foreground. During the 2022 season, he had two concussions, which had people wondering whether it's safe for him to play in the NFL. Last year seemed to put that to rest. He played in every game and led the NFL in total yards with 4,624. The Dolphins rewarded him last summer with a five-year, $212 million deal with $167 million guaranteed. Two games into that deal, the conversation has turned to whether he should retire. That decision would come only after he's medically cleared to play and would result in him forfeiting the bulk of his deal. The stakes here are uncomfortably high. Tua has a huge incentive to play, both for his legacy and his bank account. It's also incredibly risky. Football is dangerous, and it seems especially dangerous for Tagovailoa. Playing out his deal might result in long-term brain damage. This isn't a situation someone should be put in, but we're here, and now Tua has to figure out what happens next. Dolphins coach Mike McDaniel urged all of us to let Tua focus on his health, saying, you're talking about his career. His career is his. I just wish that people would for a second hear what I'm saying, that bringing up his future is not in the best interest of him. So I'm going to plead with everybody that does genuinely care that that should be the last thing on your mind. Staying in the AFC East, Hassan Reddick sat out another game and forfeited another $800,000. That brings his total fines up to around $8 million. If he keeps this going all year, he will lose $21.75 million. Per ESPN, he is not especially close to reaching a deal with the Jets. The Jets could really use him, but this is getting painful for Reddick. Meanwhile, Deshaun Watson did take the field, despite some murmurs that the Browns could have a potential out on his $230 million fully guaranteed contract. The contract, which has become a major point of interest more than two years after it was signed, does not provide any protection for suspensions this year and beyond. That became newly relevant with Watson facing a new allegation of sexual assault and battery in 2020. If he does face a new suspension, the Browns might at least explore getting out of the largest guarantee in NFL history, but the team doesn't need your sympathy here. This is exactly what they signed up for. This season could have scarcely gone worse for Florida State. On Saturday, they lost to Memphis, bringing their record to 0-3, and they paid $1.2 million for the pleasure. The brutal start, which has all but eliminated their hopes of the playoffs, has naturally led to speculation about whether head coach Mike Norvell is going to keep his job. But like many head coaches, Norvell has job security written into his contract. Firing Norvell would cost the school $65 million. That's 85% of what's remaining on his deal. He signed an eight-year extension worth $85 million after last season when FSU went undefeated during the regular season. After being excluded from the college football playoff, FSU ramped up its efforts to leave the ACC. Doing so, however, would cost the school more than $140 million before calculating any loss in media rights. The Seminoles might have to choose between keeping their coach or their conference, but for now, they're likely stuck with both. The NBA is trying to stay out of the legal battle for control of the Minnesota Timberwolves and Lynx, but they might not have a choice. Glenn Taylor, who remains the team's owners, subpoenaed the NBA for communications and information a few months ago per Sportico. That could potentially make those documents public and potentially put the league in an awkward spot depending on what they say. It's unclear how much of an effect anything internal to the NBA could have on the sale. The NBA is not a legal party in the dispute over ownership. However, the league's board of governors does need to approve every team sale. The two sides are headed toward a binding arbitration in November. That will create a strange sideshow for a season where the Wolves are expected to be title contenders. ESPN analyst Jay Williams has had to navigate through the company's layoffs and reorganization of its on-air talent. Meanwhile, Williams remains intensely interested in the college space and even would like to buy just under half of Duke basketball. Williams spoke to our editor-in-chief Dan Roberts at Front Office Sports Tuned In Summit, and you'll hear their conversation next. Great to have you here, Jay. You have been with ESPN a long time now. Yes, I have. Um, I think like 08? Yes. I looked up your, your mm -hmm. bio. Uh, doing a lot of things. I mean, you're pulling like triple or quadruple duty. You're on NBA shows. You're on First Take. You're on Get Up. I've been a part of a lot of reorgs. Let's say that. You've, you've lived through a lot yes. of reorgs. Um, talk to me a little bit about having been at uh, ESPN for this long and how things have shifted for you as a talent and, and pulling duty on all these different shows. I think uh, leadership has shifted multiple times, and I always think that's uh, a little bit of a challenge because I think uh, this is a relationship business, and I think knowing who your employer is is very important to me and having a relationship because I think a lot of times, um, you know, it, it's similar to politics. There's always a lot of chattiness 
Um, there's always a lot of rumors. So I think having direct to source access is important. Uh, just to, you know, look, I come from the Coach K era, Dan, right? So I'm used to somebody saying, hey, today you sucked, right? And I'd much rather hear direct feedback than learn about direct feedback than when it comes for contract time, frankly. So I, I think that's always been a challenge. And I think, you know, when, during that time politically, we we're at a really interesting time point um, in our history around media. There were a lot of things going on across the world with NBA lockout in China. We couldn't make certain commentary on things in China, but we could in the United States. Um, hearing social media feedback about you know, taking stands, why are you taking stands on these issues yep. and not speaking about these issues? Shut up and dribble. Shut up and dribble. Uh, and then also, like, you know, that, that moment with your phone where if you're, you're doing a lot of content, like I've been doing podcasts and things of that sort for a while, um, you go on these platforms, do you have those type of conversations? What are the repercussions if you do have those type of conversations? Uh, and then how do you manage those relationships? So I think it's always been, um, it's not been linear, it's always been a different path to get there each and every single time. But, you know, I also faced another challenge because we launched a, a radio show. You know, Stephen A. was talking about when Max Kellerman left the show, we then absorbed the Max Kellerman's overhead on our radio show with Keyshawn, J. Wool, and Max, uh, which, you know, we were also replacing Mike and Mike. So the, you know, the show, I went through different iterations during that time, but, you know, um, predominantly white demographic, mm. right? And now we're discussing heavily black topics. Mm which are always very sensitive during those times when the NBA playoffs are in the bubble, when there's a lot of conversations around Jacob Blake and all these different things that are occurring. So it's, um, it, it was a learning opportunity, frankly, for me in how to navigate that, how to stay strong in my opinions, how to maintain my relationships, while also making great content at the same time. Uh, you've been in TV long enough. Maybe there's someone in the room who doesn't realize it. Jay Williams was a big basketball star at Duke. If you had NIL when you were at Duke, I mean, one can only imagine. That's probably, you know, I don't know if that's something you think about. Like, damn. I thought about it my, my sophomore year. I mean, my sophomore year, I was national player of the year. Every time I was bringing the ball down to court, Dan, I saw the banner slide on the side of the court, right? You see all these different sponsors. You keep hearing about media rights deal. Yeah. And, you know, I, I do think, and once again, like working, out, like working with the University of Alabama and working with Jalen, I think you get a chance to firsthand to see how all these moving parts are working. You also get a chance to see... Or not Le working. Or not working. You also get a chance to see Learfield and how and everybody talks about the NCAA. Like Learfield you know, has a chokehold on this industry from a content perspective as well and the way they work with universities, which is smart on their behalf, right? Um, but inevitably, we are getting into... If the conference has representation, if coaches have representation, when will players have representation outside of just NIL deals? And that's going to go into rev share, unionization. We've been seeing that with Dartmouth Basketball yeah. and Company. Um, and with me, that means there needs to be a CBA. So, you know, I think there's some interesting things that will be occurring. And, like, you know, let's be honest, I have a Duke shirt on underneath this. Like, one day, like, I would like to own 49% of Duke basketball. In, in seriousness? One million percent. Yeah. I, I think it's an asset that, once again, we're seeing private equity enter yep. the NFL. We, always see, we already see Dow, Blue Island Company, and the NBA. I think you're going to have a lot of these, you know, ultra private e equity company already kind of looking at these assets, Arctos, all of them are. Um, but I think to, to be that bridge, to sit in between, uh, and have the capital to deploy in an asset like that. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges to things that still need to be worked out. Um, but I, I think operationalizing a program like that for the future, especially, like, you know, if you could have done it this year, I mean, the way we're going to sell Cooper Flag, mm -hmm. whether you want to call oh, yeah. him the next Christian Leitner 2.0, yeah. even though he's from Maine, he plays like a brother from Philly, if you catch my drift on what that means. Um, but I saw the way we programmed our content around Zion Williamson. Mm -hmm. I saw the way we programmed our content around Trey Young. Uh, I saw the way we tried to do it for Bronny James until he got hurt. So you will see something like what that value does for the program uh, to have economics in that is the future. You know, WNBA, it's like sky's the limit, maybe. You know, they just got the new media deal. Of course, depending on whom you ask, it's still 
underestimates how big this thing can get, but it just seems to me it's only 12 teams. I mean, the growth potential for this league right now is huge. Look, I got to be on, you know, the conversations, I, I got caught in the crosshairs of this a little bit at ESPN, which is always a challenge. Um, you know, whether it's KD calling me a liar and then us patching it up afterwards and me have to dealing with the public fallout of that. Um, but, you know, Caitlin Clark, we were talking about, you know, greatness. And, you know, I was talking as it directly correlates to the court. I'm like, we always associate greatness with winning championships, right? Mm -hmm. And I caught a lot of flack for that. But right, what the, are you saying? What are you saying? Yeah, well, you're saying she's not great. I'm like, I'm not saying that she's not great. She is great. Not win we championships? Are, we are, Tom Brady, is he the greatest? Well, he's a great, he won seven championships, right? Look, look how we correlate it. Um, but there's a lot of sensitivities to that, right, and understanding that. Um, but you saw that lightning bolt coming with the way, once again, just look at how these content engines build programming. So, I mean, we were discussing women's college basketball on first take. And Stephen A has always been an advocate of it. But like, you know, him and Monica had a real yep. moment, which I'm sure you'll tap into, right? We're gonna hear from into, Monica right? McNutt shortly, yep. Which her, her, her POV on that matter was correct as well, right? So once again, those things scale when you have the right lightning bolt to scale it off the back of. Let's call it what it is, right? So Caitlin Clark was that, whether it was Barstool Sports and you know, their owner, Portno, talking about it, you know, coming at people. You had a lot of different cooks in the kitchen that wanted mm -hmm. to be in business with that. So I, I think once again, like understanding that and then being able to invest and then having a media engine behind you to think around brand strategy. I think that's one of the biggest things that we try to focus on is, okay, it's one thing to have the asset. It's one thing to have Giannis and WhatsApp. Like what's the brand strategy? And is that staying authentic? And I think as we continue to see players like Angel Reese, you know, whether that's with Reebok and Shaquille O'Neal with Reebok and everything that they're doing there, what's the brand strategy to continue to scale her as she builds momentum with the league? Um, and I, I think that's where it gets really fascinating from an investor perspective and from a brand strategist. Mm. You mentioned something as a lightning bolt, and I want to do a little lightning round with you. Oh, okay. So this is real quick. So this is like hot takes. Out. Well, I mean, this is what you do, but it's uh. not just hot takes. As you say, it's about, you know, it's performative, doesn't mean it doesn't also have substance. Uh. But just real quick, a couple things, your quick thoughts, okay? Okay. Pat McAfee. Brilliant. Um, to be able to, I mean, he set the bar. So we talk about owning your IP. Inevitably, just own your IP, license it back. Okay. Duke football. It's been a roller coaster, but I like where we're at currently. I like where we're at. Okay. Twitter slash X, especially in the Elon Musk era. Now you're trying to get me engaged in politics. <laughs> uh, I utilize other platforms more than X. I'm more on LinkedIn than X um, for that reason. Mm. Okay, now I will do real quick politics. Election cycle coming up, an election and its impact on sports viewership. Uh, I think it's gonna be extremely impactful. I, I think also, you know, interest rates are always fascinating. Mm -hmm. Inflation is always fascinating around media rights deals, valuations, how we're looking at teams. Um, I think it's gonna be extremely impactful. I have a lot of thoughts on this. You can't ask me that question in a lightning round. Let's see who's gonna win and then I can come back and we can redo that. Okay, we'll have you back at FOS in studio. Yes. Couple more, ESPN and its flagship app plan. Look, I, I, um, we, you and I were talking about this backstage. I, I, it's always interesting being in my position because I have those direct relationships with those people that I admire, and Bob Iger and Jim Patero. Uh, I mean, Jim lives in Westport. And uh, I, you know, I heard him on the Puck interview the other day talking about flagship, focusing more on local, and it, it, it's a heavy on-taking, but I, I, I will say that I, I think we're at a unique spot right now with a lot of our media right deals, mm -hmm. and landing the NBA was a really big opportunity for us, and still having our footprint within the NFL. So I. That programming in our D2C is gonna be really fascinating to see how 
especially after all the layoffs that we had. And I think from a talent perspective, um, you can't just look at the marketplace as, I showed up and I did my one specific job. Right. How are you adding value across multiple platforms? And, and how are you thinking holistically with utilizing your ecosystem to leverage where, you, where you're going? Yep, that's just what Stephen A said. You can't just do the job. No, you have to go above me. it has to be exponentially more. I got two more for you. Turner and NBA, but specifically what that means for Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley. I'm asking a lot of people today about Barkley. Well, first up, I, I, you know, Uncle Chuck is what I call him. I really found all of his commentary really interesting, especially with everything happening with their CEO and his commentary around you know, missing the mark mm -hmm. right, um, on that contract. I, Chuck is one of the most talented people there is in sports. But you know, as I was saying to Adam White over there and, and Johnny, why work with a media company? Why just not build your own? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I don't, like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal and his relationship that he has with a lot of his different partners, I think he's brilliant. You know, Kenny Smith sitting on multiple boards, Charles Barkley and his reach. Why just not form your own entity? I, it, we, I would invest in that in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, Tell Alex me. talks about this where he talks about, VCP all the time, this acronym like Vision Capital People. So that should be the vision. They have no problem getting the capital. Right. And then who that capital comes from matters. But why wouldn't you just license that programming back to an Amazon? So for me, I, there's really no other, no other way they should be doing it other than that way. Tell him, tell him. Uh, and finally, Tom Brady on Fox. From somebody that had to... Um, learn his craft with his feet to the fire in this industry and from somebody, frankly, then that dealt with depression. I mean, I had two attempts at suicide after I got hurt. And for me, my first six to seven years at ESPN, I made $35,000 a year. Right? I was doing ESPNU games. I can't tell you how many times I was on planes walking to the back of the plane coming off my injury where people were like, oh, you, yeah, you're, you're, mm. no, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're going, why are you going to the back seat, the middle seat? You know, having to lead with my accident, having to lead with there being jealousy or me being frustrated that these people I was competing with four years ago are now, I now have to bloviate about or, or talk in a high regard around. Um, I love that Tom Brady got flack. Good for Tom Brady. The one thing that Tom Brady needs more than anything is ammunition. Hmm. You're helping Tom Brady. So, Anybody that just thinks that you can just be put in that chair and you're just gonna blow up. I mean, they love you, they hate you. They love you, they hate you, they hate you, they hate you until they learn to love you again. And if you learn that you just don't give a damn around people and what they think and you just focus on your craft, I mean, he's Tom Brady, right? I've seen Tom Brady at the Preakness. I've seen Tom Brady at certain locations where I'm like, oh, that's Tom Brady. And I can't wait for him to get comfortable enough mm. where here will be that Tom Brady. And I think when the world sees that Tom Brady, once again, with reps, if he lets that Tom Brady come out, even with his aspirations, I think we want more authenticity. I don't want Tom Brady shelled. I want Tom Brady ready to blossom and be that guy that I know he is once we have a couple of pops. Let's see it, let's see it. Can we get a round of applause for Jay? Thank you, man. Athlete-led podcasts are no longer just a side hobby. The Kelsey brothers made that official with their reported $100 million deal with Amazon for their podcast, New Heights. Playmaker HQ is betting heavy on this space. It produces the podcasts of Shaq, Angel Reese, Josh Hart, and Jalen Brunson, and others. I spoke to their CEO, Matt Schwimmer, on where all this is going, and that conversation is next. Joined now by Matt Schwimmer, CEO of Playmaker and GM of Action Network. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. So Playmaker, is a, it's a media network that hosts athlete-led podcasts. You've got Shaq, Jalen Brunson, and Josh Hart's Roommate Show, which just had that big live event. You've got Mike Miller and Udonis Haslam. What's the origin story of Playmaker? Yeah, so Playmaker's had an interesting origin, really, to, to begin with. The history of it was producing content on Snapchat in the early days of 
Snapchat. And that was kind of the primary revenue driver, but also kind of in the back was really growing a network of social media handles under Playmaker, Playmaker Bets, Playmaker TDs, and a bunch of others, um, and growing an audience of kind of call it 20 million plus unique followers across all of those handles. Um, and we got to the point where we started doing some branded campaigns, but really believed that we had the capabilities of creating really, really high quality content and the ability to amplify them, which made us a really good fit to really enter and have a right to win in this podcast space. And I wasn't with Playmaker in the origin story, but I was with Better Collective on kind of the M&A side, which is part of our thesis at Better Collective, which is why we went out and kind of acquired uh, Playmaker. And that's really where we kind of put fuel to the fire, so to say, and invest in these podcasts. How do you select athletes to work with? There's a lot of sauce in there that we want to go into to figure out what's going to make a great show. And there's not one simple answer, but we're looking at how do we think the hosts do on camera? We're always thinking about hosts in tandem, right? So who are they going to be working with? Is there a natural chemistry and connection with them? What type of guests are they going to get? What are they going to talk about? And who is going to be the core audience member of that show like won't be surprising to you that the majority of people who listen to the josh hart and jalen brunson roommates podcast and matt hillman are Knicks fans like that is a huge community that we saw come out last weekend in central park that we thought there was kind of a white space for that could have a really good show but every show needs to have a community that we think makes sense and yeah, on that Central Park event, where did that come from and what the goals of it were exactly? It seems like it was it was a big hit. Absolutely. And, and for those who don't know, we had about uh, 5,000 people in Central Park on Saturday for a three-hour live show. Brunson and Hart hosted, and we had Jon Stewart, Bridges, Marbury, J.B. Smooth, Action Brunson did a concert, um, and it was a really incredible event. I think... There's two or three things there. When we think about launching shows, the other thing is we're really thinking about community and getting communities in person for these events, I think is a really, really exciting opportunity to, to grow and expand these shows. Last spring, when the Knicks were making their playoff run, we did a few watch parties where Matt Hillman, the third co-host, hosted at a bar and we couldn't find bars in New York big enough to hold them. And the energy and the excitement at those watch parties was unbelievable, which is when we got together with Medium Rare and we all thought this makes a lot of sense. It's kind of interesting. We talk, we talked to Medium Rare about all of our podcasts and this was the one intentionally that we did this for first because it's the natural strongest community in one place. When we talk community, especially when you're talking online, it can be in many different geographic regions, whereas this one is a little bit more locked into one place, which I thought was we were able to bring it all together. The Kelsey brothers just got a reported $100 million from Amazon to, to put their show on the on their podcast network. And, you know, I could see that being exciting news on your end of like, hooray, this space is so big that you know, th there's that much, like they're worth it apparently uh, for that deal or, uh oh, um, I have to pay them more than an NFL team is paying them. Uh, so yeah, what was your reaction to that news? We were excited. I definitely exciting. I think getting to getting these podcasts on more mainstream platforms and more mainstream awareness is overall really, really good. I think we really trust our ability to create high quality shows with good audience. So just getting more acceptance about the space is really important and awesome for us. And I think we also think there's a lot of opportunity in the NFL space, you know, kind of behind those because New Heights has been around for so long. And the first week of the Marshawn Lynch Get Got podcast really exceeded our expectations and has us very excited for the potential there. Um, are there athletes out there um 
I mean, and there's sort of the, what you look for, but I know that's, that can be a lot of different things. I'm wondering if there's anyone out there who you'd like to take a chance on, whether or not you've sort of seen them in the media space. Definitely are. Um, I think when we're looking for talent, you're looking for unicorns, ideally, right? Like people who there aren't easy folks to replace. I think Angel is a perfect example. You have an amazing, electrifying new female talent who has a strong personality, but she's also an incredible entertainer, incredibly smart and well-spoken where there weren't as many in that field. So being able to sign someone like her and partner with her, I think she's, she's a unicorn that expands well beyond the sports landscape. Uh, I'm not going to overshare who, who would be in our next and up and coming pipeline and create some extra competition for ourselves. Where, where do you want to go next? Because there are, uh, you seem pretty basketball focused, uh, but are, are there, there are other sports or areas that you're looking to dive into? Yeah, so we definitely launched basketball heavy. I think we thought the playmaker social media following was basketball heavy, which is why we leaned in there to start. We've dabbled in football and, as I said, really, really excited for Marshawn. I think I view a good amount of our shows, Angel especially, as way broader than just basketball. You've seen it and you will see it on the type of guests that she's going to have that I don't think putting that show into a basketball bucket is necessarily proper, um, but we'll keep expanding into other sports. You know, globally, I think golf is really interesting, huge audience and kind of casual fans. I think soccer is really interesting in the U.S. Uh, as we get ready for the World Cup, I think. But I also think we can expand outside of sports, I think entertainment, music, and other genres definitely could be of interest for us to expand to. Yeah, I mean, that sort of gets into something I, I've been just like thinking about generally with, you know, all these athlete-led podcasts that are becoming more and more of a thing. And, you know, not just like that there are more of them, but they're taking up, I think, more space in the media world. I, I'm wondering kind of um, what you've experienced with with them in terms of you know their their desire to to go beyond sports really and and to you know be famous in different ways i think most of our talent are incredibly intelligent business men and women that are very thoughtful about how they're either kind of taking part in their post playing career or planning for their post playing career i thought one of the really cool and honestly rewarding things for the playmaker team is how our talent has been able to parlay that into other exposures. So for example, Josh Hart's, I think the roommate show for him, helped him land the TV gigs during the NBA playoffs where you saw him on ESPN and a lot of those shows similarly for Udonis Haslam. And I think being able to use the podcast as a platform, both for extra opportunities, obviously helps you with brands and connecting with fans and parlaying that into more things is really exciting. And it's why more and more athletes are coming to us to partner with us. How much of an issue is it for you that most of your talent has other gigs, you know, whether they're an active player or, you know, Shaq's, you know, have got a busy DJing schedule and is on TNT, obviously. Does that, you know, how, how much managing around that do you have to do? They're professional athletes. They are really good with their time and efficient, but it's also not something that would be surprising to us. When we start negotiating with a Shaquille O'Neal or Jalen Brunson, we know they are very busy people and understand what that is going to come. So um, hasn't really been a, a roadblock outside of what we were expecting. Where do you see this space going? Is it just more and bigger and, but kind of the same basic stuff? Or is there sort of a new level that you're expecting uh, when it comes to athlete media? I think you're already starting to see it as we get more and more shows, there is increased pressure on doing it well, which I think we're really excited about. We want to battle for the best, right? Um, you can't just put a top tier athlete on camera, hit play and publish it and think it's going to work. There's a lot more 
in the art and science of what fuels the success of our shows um, that I think often gets missed. And I think you'll see that more and more as people continuously want to do shows. And not all of them are going to be home runs, but I do think there is still a lot of white space in the industry, even though I know a lot of people feel like there's a lot of NBA shows right now. You just saw how the NBA TV rights deals just went. Like people love NBA and sports content. There's plenty of room for people to consume even more. Yeah, should be interesting to see. Matt Schimmer, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Absolutely. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming up in the business of sports. Arch Manning, nephew of Peyton and Eli, may finally be getting the chance to live up to his family name. Manning was the Texas Longhorns' third-string quarterback last season, but backup Malik Murphy transferred to Duke to take their starting job, and on Saturday, starting QB Quinn Ewers suffered an abdominal injury. That brought Manning onto the field, and he didn't disappoint. He immediately threw a touchdown pass, which ended up being his first of four. He ended it with 223 passing yards and 53 rushing yards. Despite his limited time on the field, on three gives Manning the third highest NIL valuation among all college athletes with $3.1 million. With Ewers week to week with his injury, we should get at least one more game to see if Manning is worth the hype. The Longhorns play UL Monroe on Saturday in what may suddenly be one of the most anticipated games of the college season. That's it for today. Subscribe, rate, review, like, share. We'd appreciate your support, however you can give it. And let us know your thoughts by sending an email to today at frontofficesports.com and you could be featured on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.